Okay, well, good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. I guess here in South Dakota, it's morning. For those of you in other parts of the world, it's it could be afternoon or evening. So welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, what can the stars tell us about the universe's missing matter? Why do researchers who study dark matter go as far from the stars as they possibly can? Well, today we are joined by someone who can help us answer those questions and many others about dark matter. Dr. Hugh Lippincott, who is the spokesperson for the Lux Zeppelin Dark Matter Experiment, which is located deep underground at SURF, is going to discuss the hints that stars give us um, about and the difficulty of completing a rare search, a rare event search, and how the Lux Zeppelin dark matter detector will break records as it takes data this year. Welcome, uh, Hugh. Hugh, how how are you this morning? Doing great, thanks. I, I do want to uh, just chat with you for a second. The other day we were on SDPB uh, talking with a reporter, and at one point your cell phone dropped and you left us on a cliffhanger. The last word we heard was annihilation. So I hope you'll fill us in on that during your talk today. I hopefully will finish that thought somewhere <laughs> early on. Okay, um, well, well, we're so glad to have you here and I'm just going to turn this over to you and you can talk directly to our audience. Okay, great. Um, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, so I'm sitting in a small room in Santa Barbara, California. Um, and I'm gonna oh, share my screen to do slides. Uh, so let's get going. Um, yes, okay, can everybody see that? Yes, we could see it, Hugh. Okay, great. Um, so again, thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Sorry I couldn't be there in person, um, but perhaps next year. Um, so this is a lovely picture of the Sanford Underground Research Facility, <clears throat> looking at the two head frames. Um, and today I'm going to try to tell us more about the dark matter that we think is, is between the stars. So let's start with the only joke I'll have in the entire talk. Uh, in the beginning, the universe was created. Uh, this made a lot of people very angry and has been widely regarded as a bad move. Um, this is from one of my favorite authors, Douglas Adams. Uh, but it's true, in the beginning, the universe was created. And this is our sort of model of how we think the universe has expanded and evolved since then. And I'll talk about this in a bit more detail. But you can start all the way in the back, uh, in the left here, about 13 billion years ago. And then the universe has been sort of evolving to, since that point today so that humanity can have deep thoughts about how the universe got to be there um, as we are today. <clears throat> so let me start with sort of the top line story which is uh, in sort of particle physics and astrophysics, there's a pretty strong consensus about how much stuff there is in the universe. And when I say stuff, I mean matter and energy. And I'm sure many of the people in the audience are familiar with Einstein's famous uh, equation E equals MC squared, which is a way to relate energy to matter. So matter and energy are at some level the same type of thing. They're sort of you know stuff, energy, density. And so there's strong consensus about how much stuff there is in our universe. But by that same consensus, the stuff that makes us up, the stuff that makes up our Earth, and the stuff that makes up things like the sun and the stars we see at night is about 4% of that total. So 95% of the universe is actually a mystery to humankind, which is quite a strong statement when you think about it. You know, we understand a lot, but there's so much that we do not understand. So there's a little pie chart here at the bottom, which tries to put a brave face on what we don't know by giving titles to the stuff that we don't understand. And so you'll see that most of this pie chart is made up of dark energy and dark matter. Now the dark energy, I'm not even gonna try to address. That's a whole different talk. Um, many people much smarter than I could tell you what, we little, what little we do not know about dark energy. Uh, but what I am gonna try to talk about is the dark matter. <clears throat> so it turns out that something like 80% of the matter in the universe um, is this dark matter and only the, and the remaining 20% is the stuff that we understand. So this is what we're gonna talk about today. <clears throat> now, when a scientist tells you some statement like that, you know, we only understand 4% of the universe or this is the things that we know or think, the first question any, you know, reasonable person should ask is, well, how do we know this, right? Always be skeptical of the experts, um, not to the point of disbelieving them, but to the point of saying, well, how do we know what we know? And so that's what I'm gonna to try to talk about for the next sort of 10 to 20 minutes. How do we know what we think we know here? So let's go back to the evidence, which is always where you should start. 
So I'm going to start at the sort of smallest scales in our astrophysical observations, which are galaxy rotation curves. And these were really pioneered by a scientist named Vera Rubin in the 1970s. Um, she really led this field. So galaxy rotation curves. So let's start with a nice picture of a spiral galaxy. We've all seen pictures like this. Um, you know, see a galaxy up in space. It's spiraling because it's spinning around at the center of its galaxy, just like the Earth goes around the sun or like the sun goes around the Milky Way center, things orbit each other in space. And so the spiral galaxy is, is doing this orbiting. Um, now, probably some of you in the audience have heard of something called the Doppler effect. Um, I won't be able to go into too much detail, but the Doppler effect is a statement that um, a wave will change its frequency depending on the relative speed of an observer and the source. So this is most familiar to us probably if we're you know, on a street corner and a, a cop car goes by or a fire, fire engine goes by with our siren blaring. The pitch of the siren will change as the car passes us because at one point it's coming towards us, so the pitch is higher and it goes away from us and so the pitch is lower. So you can tell um, by the change in pitch uh, how fast the truck is actually moving. It turns out that light is also a wave. And so we can do the same thing with light. And so if a galaxy, if you're looking head on to a spiral galaxy, one side is spinning away from you, the other side is spinning towards you. And so you can tell by the shift in color from one side to the other, how fast that galaxy is spinning or how fast those stars are moving. So you can measure how fast these stars are actually orbiting in the galaxies that are very far away from us. So that's really uh, a nice way of making observations. The next thing you can do um, is go back to your freshman year physics class for those who took physics in college or even in high school, actually, you probably might learn some of this and think about gravity. Now, we all know what gravity is. Gravity is what prevents us from floating away off the surface of the Earth um, because we are bound to the Earth by the force of gravity. Gravity is what makes the Earth go around the sun because it's bound by the force of gravity. So this is a well-known, very familiar force to us in nature. And it turns out that the force of gravity, uh, the strength of that force goes like mass over distance squared. So a very heavy, large object attracts you with gravity more strongly, but the farther away you get from it, the weaker that force is. And so this makes sense to us, right? The sun is a very large object, and that's why the Earth goes around the sun. But the farther are you away from the sun, the less strongly it's binding you. So this is how the force of gravity works. It goes like mass over distance squared. Another thing you might learn in freshman year physics is how are you bound into a circular orbit? Um, and again, this, this is just straight kinematics if, for, for those of you who have taken it or will take it. And I hope everybody who listens to this talk will go out and take their closest physics class as soon as they can. Um, but basically, if you're in a circular orbit, the force required to keep you in that orbit is the velocity squared divided by the distance. And again, this makes sense from an intuitive sense, right? If you've ever, um, I don't know, played with a lasso or something, right? The harder you're spinning it around, so the faster it's moving, the more you have to hold on to the center. You need more force to keep it moving faster. But similarly, if it goes farther away from you, it doesn't take quite as much force to pull it around because it's farther out. So we have two equations for force here. We have one that's the binding force of gravity, and the other is the force that keeps you in orbit. And we can just set them equal to each other. And that's what I've done at the bottom of the screen here, if you can see my mouse. So we have an equation that says the velocity goes like mass over distance. <clears throat> okay, so if you followed me there, and I hope many of you have, uh, the next question is, all right, now we have a galaxy. We've measured how fast the stars are moving by using this Doppler effect I referred to. And so let's plot how fast things are moving versus the distance from the center. Okay, so if you follow me into that sort of thought experiment, then the statement is, if all of the mass in this galaxy is in the bright part of the galaxy, the visible part of the galaxy that we can clearly see, right? Then once you leave the visible part of the galaxy, things should slow down because the amount of mass is staying the same, right? All the mass was in the bright part, but the distance has gotten bigger. And so therefore the velocity has to go down. So what you would do is you would expect to see if again, all of the mass was in the bright part of the galaxy, you would expect to see on a plot. So I'm a physicist. Our, basically, our whole career is based on making plots. You will see a few plots in this talk, um, but this one is maybe the most important. Um, if I'm going to plot velocity versus distance from the center of the galaxy, you would expect to see this red line, right? You have something moving relatively quickly, but then once you leave the bright part of the galaxy, you're going to fall off because the distance is getting up, the distance is going up, but the mass is not. Okay, so this is what we expect to see if all of the mass is in the bright part. 
But what we actually see is this yellow, is this white line. So things stay moving much, much, much faster than they should be if all of the mass was in the bright part. So if they're moving too fast to be bound by the amount of visible matter, and that is evidence that we're missing something. There's something that we're not seeing that is extending to well beyond the luminous extent of the galaxy. And what is that stuff? That, that's providing gravitational binding material. Okay. I hope you followed that argument. Again, I, I, it's a little hard in the remote uh, format to get feedback from the audience, but I'm going to look around and imagine that I see people nodding their heads at me and staying with me, so I'll keep going. <clears throat> okay. So these are these galaxy rotation curves. This is actual data um, <clears throat> taken from various galaxies around the universe. Again, you would expect to see something dropping off as you go large in distance. And actually we see something staying high and flat to much, much, much larger than the luminous extent of the galaxy. So that's evidence for something we're not seeing. We call it dark matter. All right, so that's galaxies. Galaxies turn out to be one of the smallest objects we have in our universe. <clears throat> so let's go to slightly larger scales and talk about galaxy clusters. So galaxy clusters are collections of galaxies, very, very, very large, very dense. They're much, much bigger than a galaxy. So the Milky Way, I don't actually have the numbers in my head, but the you know, galaxy clusters are you know, hundreds of times the size of the Milky Way. Um, so now I'll bring another character into the story, um, which was a man named Fritz Vicky. And for some reason, I think he may not have been the most popular uh, among his <laughs> colleagues because you always see this picture in talks uh, of, of Fritz uh, that include uh, references to his work. But in fact, you can find much nicer pictures of the man. Um, and so I will use this picture to show somebody who doesn't look quite so crazy and angry as in the previous picture. All right, so Fritz Vicky, uh, actually even before uh, Vera Rubin, so back in the 1930s, he made the first observations of galaxy clusters. And basically he found the same thing, that the galaxies in the clusters were moving much too fast to be bound by the amount of visible matter. And so he first postulated the existence of the stuff called dark matter. Nowadays, we have a whole host of types of observations that we can make on galaxy clusters. And so one um, super powerful one is this something called gravitational lensing. This is where we're, we're gonna start getting into a bit of the sort of you know, mind blowing aspects of astrophysics. Um, so this is another thing that comes from Einstein. And maybe you've heard of this from general relativity, which is that um, gravity can actually bend light. Okay, so much like you know my glasses are a lens, and so they'll focus light uh, that comes into my glasses into my eyes so that I can see clearly. Um, if you if instead of um, my glasses being a lens, like a glass lens, was actually a super dense object like a, uh, a galaxy cluster, it would bend the light also into my eyes. So this is a picture of something like that. So in the center of this picture is a big galaxy cluster. So you can think of this very bright spot in the middle as a very, very dense, highly gravitational object. And what you see around this central object are these sort of um, smeared rays of light. You can see them, I hope you can see in my mouse, all the way around this, uh, this galaxy. So what that is, is an object behind the central cluster that has been lens, and so the light's been distorted, but you can clearly see this sort of lensing effect, right? This looks just like you might see with like a magnifying glass um, in a particular uh, arrangement, um, and you can see the light being distorted. So what we can do with this is by the sort of size of these distortions, we can actually measure the mass of the object in the middle. We can measure basically the size of the lens or the, or the focusing of the lens. And when you do that, you can plot out where is the gravitational force in this picture. And what you get is something that looks like this. So here's another plot. Um, but you can imagine that as things go up in this plot, that is a gravitational sort of binding force or gravitational force. So you see all these little spikes. The spikes are the individual galaxies and stars, right? You can see there's bright spots in the galaxy. And so there's, you know, hot spots in the map. But what you also see is this very sort of large mountain underneath all the spikes, right? That's really where most of this gravitational force is coming from, this sort of mountain, and that's not visible, right? We don't see that um, in the picture. You don't see brightness coming out of it, but that shows up clearly in the gravitational lens, and that's the dark matter. That's the matter that's providing this gravitational force, this gravitational lens that we're not seeing, but we clearly know it is there. We can go even further with these galaxy clusters and ask what happens when two galaxy clusters collide? So this is a picture of a very famous um, measurement called the bullet cluster. 
Um, and so what happened here is you have two galaxy clusters that have collided and they've color coded some of the observations here. So in red is what you see when you look at this, um, this part of space with X-rays. So X-rays is a particular wavelength of light that is interacting with normal matter quite a lot, right? So um, we'll see X-rays coming off of normal matter activity, things that we understand produce X-rays. But when you look with gravitational lensing, which remember is really what's pulling out the sort of the mass, where's all the matter, that's shown in blue. And so what's happened here, if you can sort of imagine in your head is you had two objects that came together. I don't know if you can see me, but I have my hands going. So two objects came together and collided and the normal matter, which is the X-rays interacted and got stuck, right? So they collided and sort of, you know, sort of got stuck and stuck, stuck through each other. Whereas the gravity, which is in blue, just went straight through. And so we have a separation of the gravity, which is where most of the matter is in blue, and the visible stuff in red. And so that separation, again, is very clear evidence that there is mass that we're not seeing that's not interacting with light in the usual way. Um, and that is something we call dark matter. Okay, so I'm trying to make this evidence as airtight as I possibly can. So we've talked about galaxies, individual galaxies. Then we've talked about larger objects like galaxy clusters, which is through various observations we see can hold the same picture. And the last thing I'm gonna talk about is cosmology. Um, so cosmology is sort of the study of actually how the universe really evolved from the Big Bang to today. Um, it's the study of sort of how the universe got to where it is. <clears throat> um, and there's something called the cosmic microwave background, which is part of this. Um, but this picture that I'm showing you here is a sort of rendition of what the universe looks like if you map out all the structure in the universe. And it's this super cool, like filamentary structure. So if you look closely, you'll see lots of little bright spots in sort of nodes in this filament. Those are the galaxy clusters. And then there's sort of strings that attach them to each other. Um, and so this is actually what we think our universe looks like if you map out the, the sort of matter content of our universe. But how did we get here? And we can actually answer that question or we think that we can. So this is a simulation of what the universe might have done as it evolved. <clears throat> um, so I'll play it again so we can look at it a bit more closely. Um, but as you see, as we get to the end, you can start to see the, the, the production of that sort of structure, the filamentary structure. But it started in this very sort of uniform, not very, um, there's no structure here, right? This is sort of flat. This is what things looked like very early in the universe. But as the universe started to evolve, quickly you start to resolve into structure. All right, so what's going on there? And the answer uh, depends crucially on the existence of the stuff that we call dark matter. So what's happening is when you start the universe, you know, things are, as I say, very uniformly distributed, but there are little pockets of over density. And so what's happening is that as the universe expands, those overdense popula populations, gravity is an attractive potential, right? Gravity attracts things to each other. So it grabs more mass. And over time, more and more mass falls into those little pockets and you get the, the formation of structure, right? So each one of these galaxies um, or these galaxy clusters started as a small little pocket of overdensity. And as the universe evolved over 13 billion years, it grabbed and grabbed more and more mass to create the structure that we see now. This whole process needs to have dark matter. If you didn't have dark matter, this would not have happened. And so this is another plot. The details don't matter crucially, except to show that these points here are real data trying to measure the structure that we see in the universe. And then the lines are models for how we got there. And if you try to model this without putting in a component of dark matter, you don't come close to the observations, right? You need dark matter to make that structure. So the point that I'm making here is that when you look up at the sky at night, you see stars, you see beautiful, um, beautiful structures in the sky. None of that would exist if the dark matter hadn't formed the sort of gravitational glue, the binding attraction to pull things together, right? The reason we see structure is because there was this extra gravitational force to bind things together. So the dark matter really is sort of a, you know, an existential statement, like we wouldn't be here having this wonderful conversation on Zoom if the dark matter hadn't been there to form the glue to bring things together. And you can say that both from looking at structure, and I mentioned the CMB, this cosmic microwave background. 
The cosmic microwave background is a super cool thing that the astrophysicists have learned about, which is it's a snapshot of the universe as it was 13 billion years ago. And you make these lovely maps of, again, this is sort of density, um, whereas some, some spots are over dense and some spots are under dense. And those are the things that seeded our structure and led to the picture that we see today. And I'll skip over this plot. <clears throat> okay, so to conclude, the stars are quite clearly telling us that something in our understanding of particle physics, something in our understanding of gravity is missing. Um, and the question is, well, what is that thing that we're missing? I'll take a quick pause to grab another drink of water. I hope you're with me so far. Okay. <clears throat> Good. So let's move on. If you have followed so far and you agree with me that you know something is existing that we're missing the next question you might ask is well what is it so let's uh let's see what we know well we know it interacts gravitationally that's been the point of the last 20 minutes of the talk and we know it's dark in the sense that it's not interacting with light in the usual way so what could that be so let me ask a facetious question has anybody in the room ever heard of a neutrino um what day is this again that we're all celebrating it's of course neutrino day so maybe dark matter is a similar particle to a neutrino. Now, I don't think I'm gonna completely define neutrinos are for this audience, but I'll just very briefly uh, introduce the point that I'm trying to make here, which is that there are four forces that we know of in physics. There's gravity, which we've been talking about. There's electromagnetism, you know, opposite charges repel, sorry, attract, like charges repel. That's also light. There's the strong force and the weak force. The strong force holds protons and neutrons together. The weak force is involved in nuclear reactions uh, and radioactivity. And so the weak force is what I wanna talk about here. So it's involved in nuclear reactions. It's not weak per se, but it is extremely rare. Um, so to interact with something weakly, uh, you have to be really, 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 really close to it. Um, and I'll, I'll say what I mean about that in a second. So neutrinos are a particle that we know about that interacts via this force. Um, they're produced in nuclear reactions. It turns out that the sun is a giant nuclear reactor. Um, that is what powers the sun. And so it's producing neutrinos all the time. And one of my favorite lines, which probably is heard in many talks on Neutrino Day over the years, is that 100 billion neutrinos just pass through your fingernail every second. So they're just streaming through us all the time in massive, massive, massive quantities. But because they only interact weakly, the electrons and atoms and molecules that make up our bodies or make up the Earth are essentially far enough apart that we're transparent. The neutrinos just go straight through and don't interact. I think that, you know, there's a famous statement that you can have a light year of lead and the neutrinos will just go straight through that light year of lead. So the idea is maybe dark matter does the same thing, right? We're looking for something that sort of behaves like this. And so what we do is we call this particle that we're looking for a weakly interacting massive particle, which is quite a technical term, right? Weakly interacting, massive because it interacts via gravity and it's a particle. So that's quite literal, but of course you can turn it into a really great acronym, which is a WIMP. So we're looking for WIMPs. Um, now I should say, this is only one hypothesis for what dark matter is. Um, it's the one that my experiment looks for in particular, but there are others. Um, and so I hope uh, if you are interested by this talk, you'll look up some of those other opportunities, but there are many, many, many sort of theories of what this might be. And this is only one, although I personally think it's a very good one. Okay, so we're looking for WIMPs. Um, and I'll give you one more sort of argument about why this may be a good idea. And I'm going to push to the limits a really bad metaphor of soups to do this. Um, so I hope you forgive me. I spent some time looking at clip art of soups online the other day. And so I have some pictures of soup bowls in various forms over the next slide. Um, all right. So let's start from the beginning and suppose there is a wimp particle in the soup of the universe. Again, forgive the bad, strange metaphor, uh, just after the Big Bang. Um, so early on in this early soup, there's enough energy to create and destroy particles all the time. And this is where we get to the cutoff from the, the radio interview of annihilation. So what we're talking about here is particles are created, but particles are also quote unquote annihilated, which means they, you know, this E equals MC squared um, equation from Einstein, you can convert matter into energy. Um, and so that's what annihilation is, but you can also go the other way. So if things are hot enough, you will create particles, you'll destroy particles, you'll create particles, you'll destroy particles or annihilate particles, and everything's in sort of equilibrium. And because you're hot enough, there's a lot of different types of particles around. So your soup has noodles, your soup has some chicken, your soup has some spinach and you know onions. It's got all of the ingredients you want in a super exciting, interesting soup because things are being created and destroyed all the time coming in and out of the soup of particles. Okay. But things don't stay like that forever. In fact, the universe expands, the universe cools. As the universe 
cools, you can no longer create the particles, but you can always destroy them because they're, they're turning into energy, right? So if, if two dark matter particles come together, they will annihilate each other and turn into energy. So as the universe cooled, you can no longer create them, but they can still be destroyed. And so now your soup still is a delicious soup, but it's more monochromatic, right? You don't have species being created all the time. What you're left with is sort of the lower energy, lower mass, more regular matter type of stuff. You're no longer having every particle, possible particle you can think of to be created. You only have the ones that are sort of relatively light. And so you're no longer making wimps, but you are destroying them. Then what happens is that the universe keeps expanding. <clears throat> and so your bowl of soup, what you can sort of think about, I mean, eating it, I guess, is one way, which is what this next picture thinks. But really what you're doing is you're giving out soup to lots and lots and lots of people. And so now instead of having one bowl of soup, you have like a thousand cups of soup and each soup cup has a very small amount. Um, and so because of that, now your particles can no longer find each other to be destroyed because their density has gotten small enough that they never run into each other. So to annihilate, you needed two particles, but if they can never find each other, they'll never annihilate. And that means that now there's the number of them is fixed in time. So that's the end of my extended soup metaphor. I don't know how well it works, but you can tell me at the end of the talk. So here's a plot, my famous plot that tries to show this process in sort of a mathematical context. So the x-axis here is time. So you can think of the beginning of the Big Bang here and sort of where we are today here. And then what's going on in the y-axis is the density of dark matter particles, the number density. So at the beginning, everything's in equilibrium. We're making particles, we're destroying them, but you know the, the number is roughly constant. Then as the universe cools, we're no longer making them, but we are destroying them. And so the number density goes down. And then eventually they can no longer find each other to annihilate. And so the number density flattens out again. And that's fixed from this point in time to today. This is what we call freeze out. And it turns out to occur at just the right point to match the current observations that we see for how much dark matter we think there is now. So if you have this wimp-like particle, sort of accidentally, um, you know, there was no reason that some of the things you would put into this cross section uh, would, would match this number, but the sort of Numerologic, numerologically, it, it, it sort of agrees with what we might expect. So that's a, a coincidence. Physicists hate coincidences. Um, normally, we want there to be an explanation for why that, that exists. And so the hope is that actually this particle does exist and that could, that could explain it. All right. So the stars are telling us that something is missing, but maybe they're also pointing towards the answer. And the answer might be a particle called a WIMP. All right. I will take another quick break. Everybody hold, catch their breath, have a drink of water. And we'll shift to the next part of the talk. All right, everybody with me? I'm again imagining a whole room of nodding, smiling people. Um, I hope that is true in reality. Um, I guess we'll find out at the end. Um, so we look for WIMPs. Um, and so the rest of the talk is now going to be talking about how do we detect WIMPs or what do we do when we say we look for them? So in our model, <clears throat> WIMPs are just like neutrinos are passing through us all the time. A few billion go through you every second. Could we perhaps see a handful of counts in a detector in a year? So is there some chance that a dark matter particle may bang into a regular nucleus and we can see it, which is what happens after all with neutrinos, right? Enough neutrinos go through your detector. Every once in a while, one does something and you can see it. Maybe WIMPs are the same. So we're looking for a handful of counts in a detector per year. That doesn't sound so hard. The problem is that low level radioactivity on Earth is everywhere. So. When I'm saying a detector, I'm saying we're building a very, very sensitive radiation detector. But of course, that radiation detector will see other radioactivity. And on Earth, it just turns out that there's radioactivity everywhere. So bananas, bananas have potassium in them. Potassium has a radioisotope that, is, uh, that decays and will give you radioactivity. Um, of course, none of this is dangerous for people. It's just sort of environmental radioactivity that's everywhere. But if you build your sensitive detector, it's going to go off. Um, if you own your own home or live in a house with a basement, you may know about radon. Radon is a radioactive gas. It's basically the bane of all dark matter physicists because it's just everywhere and super annoying and it's hard to get rid of, but it's there. Um, so, so the bottom line is that if you have a Geiger counter, and a Geiger counter is that cool device in James Bond movies that ticks when there's radioactivity around. Um, you will have seen it. If you watched the recent Chernobyl series, you'll have heard them. A Geiger counter goes off something like 100 times per second per kilogram. That's 3 trillion times per year in a ton scale experiment. None of that is dark matter, right? And so if we're looking for a handful of counts 
in three trillion events. It's like finding the needle in a haystack. And I wish it were as easy as it is in this picture to find the needle. Um, but that's the difficulty is these backgrounds. So we call this uh, radioactivity field of you know, bananas and radon and other things. We call that background. And we're looking for the signal in the background. OK. So what are the sources of background? The, the, one of the main ones are cosmic rays. So cosmic rays are highly energetic particles. They come from space. They stream through, <clears throat> excuse me, they stream through all the time. It uh, turns out if that you are a pilot, an airline pilot or a flight attendant over the course of your lifetime, you'll actually receive a higher radiation dose than somebody who only works on the surface of the earth. Again, not dangerous, um, but it is something that they think about in their uh, you know, occupational safety rules. So just because you're closer to the source of these cosmic rays. So what do we do about these is we actually go underground. And so this brings us to um, the Sanford lab. Um, which is why we're having this wonderful discussion. Sanford Lab provides us with a place where we can go underground to be shielded from these cosmic rays. So here's a picture of me. I'm very happy to be going to work in the morning uh, at the Yates shaft of Sanford Lab. And I'll very quickly show a quick clip of what that looks like. You know, you walk into the cage and then you, you go underground. And in the morning, you know, it's six o'clock in the morning, you're drinking your coffee. Um, they keep the shaft, um, the, the shaft has to be a little wet. You can see some water dripping to, to keep it uh, sort of flexible and vibrant. So you're getting a little rained on in the morning as you go down underground. But, you know, it's a super interesting place to do your work. And you end up, uh, and, and so when you've gone underground, you end up on the set of what sort of looks like a 1980s science fiction movie. Um, this is the Davis campus where the LZ experiment is maintained. There's exposed piping, there's cool, you know, this is shotcrete on the walls. Um, there's pumps and stuff around, and this is where my experiment is located. Um, so this is all underground because we have to get away from those cosmic rays. So we thank greatly the Sanford Lab for providing us with the space to do this kind of work. All right, but cosmic rays aren't the only source. Um, I've talked about just contamination in general. So there's rock. Uh, turns out that the rock underground is quite radioactive. There's the radon I mentioned before, impurities. Um, so if you have, you know, if you touch something, your fingers have oils on them. Those oils can collect dust. That dust can be radioactive. So there's just a huge emphasis on keeping everything in your detector clean so that nothing can get in to contaminate it. So here are some pictures that I'll come back to later. This is a colleague of mine, Alvin Kamaha of uh, University of Albany. She is in a full clean room garb to make sure that nothing can contaminate the experiment as, we'll, uh, as we assemble it. Here's more pictures of us assembling the detector um, in a very clean room, people looking at stuff. I like this picture because it combines the super high tech of you know, full clean room suits. And uh, this thing here is an ion fan with everybody's favorite kitchen tool, uh, aluminum foil. Uh, which we use to keep things clean. So the high tech and the low tech, you know, physicists are not immune to that kind of, uh, to using aluminum foil for everything as well, it turns out. <laughs> okay, so we, we keep things clean, um, but we still have to build an experiment, right? And the experiment itself is built out of, you know, real materials like steel or glass or other detector components. And so there are two things that we can do to remove the radioactivity from the detector itself. One is called self-shielding. And this is the idea that radioactivity will range out. So if you have a large sort of uniform volume of detector material, um, the radioactivity outside that volume will be absorbed in some outer shell, leaving a center to be clean. And here is a picture of that, what that might look like. This is real data from the Lux experiment, which is a precursor to my own experiment. Um, and the colors show sort of event rates. And so red, is super high event rates and blue is super low event rates. And so what you can see is that all the radioactivity is getting absorbed at the edge of this detector, leaving the center being quite clean. And what this tells you is being bigger is better for this kind of thing because you have more central volume that's left, uh, left clean from the radioactivity hitting the edges. The other thing you can do is called discrimination. Is there something you can do to separate explicitly that needle from all the hay of the background? So this is, uh, I won't go too much into detail on this, um, but one nice thing that we think we know about the dark matter is that it's going to interact uh, with nuclei. So this is a picture of, um, actually, I believe this is a crystal from an experiment called CEMS. <clears throat> but the idea here is that there's a nucleus and then there are electrons that orbit the nucleus. This is sort of atomic theory. And dark matter is going to bang into the nucleus and the nucleus is the thing that we're trying to detect. We call that a nuclear recoil or an NR. 
whereas most of the backgrounds will actually interact with electrons. And it's the electron that deposits the energy, and we call that an electron recoil. So if you can tell these two things apart, you can eliminate all of these ER backgrounds and just look for the thing that you care about. So discrimination is hugely important for these experiments. All right, so where are we? Uh, the hunt for dark matter, I would say, is now probably the most important topic in particle physics. Others may quibble with the most, but it's certainly one of the most. I would say it's the most important. Um, it's really taken off in the last two decades. I think, you know, in 2000, it wasn't as, uh, as well recognized as it is today, and there were still other things that people were looking at, but now it's really become very important. But so far, we haven't found it. So what have we been doing? Well, we found where it is not. So we've run experiments and we have seen no signal. And so that tells us something about the properties of dark matter would be like what, you know, how would dark matter elude these experiments? And so we can say concrete things about it. So that's helpful, but it, it provides us feedback and theory feedback and to sort of refine our models of what it might be. But it's not as exciting as actually finding it, but we haven't given up yet. And so that leads me to sort of the final topic of the day, which will be the lead, the Lux Zeppelin detector. So let's try to define, design together the perfect dark matter detector. So there's a few challenges that I've sort of alluded to throughout the talk. First, it's extremely rare, right? We, we, we've talked about how uh, rarely the dark matter will interact. And so the way to sort of attack that challenge is to get more and more target, right? You wanna give it more opportunities to interact with something. So the bigger target you can get, the better. Now you need that sensitivity, right? So what you wanna get is lots of signal out when the dark matter interacts. Then of course there's backgrounds, backgrounds and backgrounds. How do we knock down the extra stuff that we don't want? And so you need to be able to purify, you need to be able to shield and you need to do discrimination. And so that leads me to the LZ detector. LZ is short for Lux Zeppelin. Lux Zeppelin is in turn short for two other terrible acronyms. Um, so us particle physicists, we love our acronyms. Um, I think the Zeppelin acronym, which was uh, an experiment based in the UK, is really one of the most backronyms, as they call them, where somebody came up with Zeppelin and then worked on a terrible con combination of words to get back to the acronym. But anyway, we love our acronyms. Let's just call it LZ for now. Um, so this is the LZ detector, and I'll tell you a little bit about it over the next, uh, the remainder of this presentation. All right, so what is LZ? The heart of LZ is a bucket of liquid xenon. And I mean that quite literally, it is just a bucket of xenon. Xenon is normally a gas, um, it's a noble gas. It's used, it used to be used in plasma TVs actually, although it's, there's not so many of those these days. Um, it's also used in anesthesia, anesthesia <clears throat> um, but it's just a gas uh, that's uh, present at some very low concentration in, in the atmosphere. And it liquefies at something like minus 100 degrees Celsius. Um, so you can turn that gas into a liquid. Um, and when you do, uh, it turns out to be quite a dense liquid. <clears throat> um, and so you can get a lot of it in a relatively small space. So LZ will have 10 tons of liquid xenon. That's bigger than any previous or existing dark matter experiment in terms of the targets. And it actually represents 15% of the world's yearly production of xenon, which is quite an amazing feat. Um, <clears throat> and so we're using a lot of xenon uh, relative to sort of the rest of the world in this experiment. All right, so it's a bucket of liquid xenon. Why do we wanna make this bucket? You know, what, is the, what is the point of the xenon? And so the real sort of, you know, the heart of it is that when radiation passes through xenon, so here's sort of a, an image of what's going on. You have some particle comes through, it bangs into a xenon nucleus or electron in the detector. You get a flash of light. We call that scintillation. It's quite a romantic name. I love the name scintillation. Um, but scintillation is just a flash of light. And so you can see all these little photons that are being produced by this interaction. Then you also get release of charge. And so those are electrons that are freed. And so what we do is we actually put an electric field across this bucket. So now we're getting a little bit technical, so I hope you'll still bear with me. But if you have an electric field that goes across the, the whole, this whole detector, that will drift the electrons. And we can collect them as we do up here um, in another flash of light. So you get two signals. You get an initial light, uh, light signal, and then later on you get an electron signal. Um, so there's a lot of signals. That's good. That's one of the things that we wanted was to be able to see the events. And then you also get this thing called discrimination. So the light to charge ratio 
tells you what type of event made the interaction in the first place. And so that's the discrimination for background rejection. So Xenon combines really a really nice set, set of properties. You get a lot of signal. It's very dense, so it shields itself super well and it provides discrimination. And so these things are, are why you might put it into what the perfect detector would be. All right, so now I'll show you the first picture round um, of the day of what the assembly of this detector looked like. All right, so how do we collect the light? Well, to collect the light, we need to have eyes. <clears throat> um, and so you can see them in the sort of model here as these arrays of little circles on the top and the bottom. These are what we call photomultiplier tubes, uh, but basically they're just light sensors. So we have arrays of light sensors at the top and the bottom, and this is what they look like in reality. <clears throat> so each one of these little um, goldish circles is a light sensor, and we have something like 494 PMTs in, our, in these two arrays at top and bottom. This is just a beautiful detector, by the way, so I'm going to dwell on these pictures because I love them so much. All right, so we have these two eyes. There's 11 miles of cabling to read the signals from those eyes. And so this gets back to my colleague Alvin here, who is doing um, the, some of the cabling work. You can see all these hangs of cables. And again, she's in full clean room garb. All of these cables had to be cleaned to make sure there was no dust on them. It was a hugely complicated and sort of laborful task. Um, but all of these uh, signals have to be read out and we have to be able to read them. And so that required 11 miles of cabling. All right, I mentioned electric field. So we have to have a set of grids and metal rings to provide the high voltage to collect the electrons. So this is a picture of assembling the center part of this detector. Um, again, full clean room garb. Um, they're putting together these very fine meshes of grids. Um, this uh, white stuff is Teflon. We use Teflon because it's very uh, reflective. So we keep as much of the light that's graded as we can. Every bolt, screw, connector, and zip tie that went into this detector was screened for radioactivity. So this gets back to the thing I was saying before about you know, backgrounds. We want to make sure that every single component of this experiment, we know what the, what the sort of radioactivity that comes from it is so that later on we can, we can put it into our models. And then all of this was assembled, as I said, in a, in a high quality clean room. This is a picture of Jake Davis from Sanford Lab doing the final sort of mating of the top to the bottom of this detector. And again, it was carefully scoured for dust. So these are two researchers using UV lights, uh, flashlights to look for dust in the detector. And we, you know, we spent, and some people in particular spent um, many, many, many hours just combing over this thing, looking for little specks of dust. Uh, it was just painstaking, um, painstaking work. Then when the thing was finally assembled, <clears throat> it's loaded into an ultra pure titanium vessel. Um, so this provides uh, the sort of containment for the xenon, this titanium vessel, and then it's brought underground. So again, we, we do all of our experiments at SURF um, underground in the Davis Cavern. So back in October of 2018, this experiment uh, was brought underground uh, through a great deal of effort from a number of people. Okay, so this is the center of the detector. But we're not done yet, right? Remember, I made this huge emphasis on shielding and I made a huge emphasis on backgrounds. And so this gets me to a question that I hope many of you are thinking in the audience, which is, you know, when you run this experiment and you take your data, how will you know that you've seen the dark matter? And this is a hugely critical question that we wrestle with all the time, right? And we, I got this question um, on the radio the other day. How do we know? Um, and the answer is that we, you know, we don't know, but we're going to do everything we possibly can to understand exactly what we have in this experiment so that when we see something unexpected, we can say with some confidence, that's the dark matter. That's the thing we didn't expect. So, <clears throat> so we have this central xenon detector, but now we have to do more to knock everything else down to that level of understanding. So we want to reduce the background as much as possible. We want to understand any remaining background to answer this question, how do we know if we've seen dark matter? And so we need another detector. So here is sort of a, an engineering model of what the detector looks like. Here's the central part that we've just been talking about. That's the central xenon detector. But we put that in a whole nother set of other stuff and shield it very, very well. And so this is called the LZ outer detector. And now I'll tell you a little bit about that. So the outer detector, um, is a collection of acrylic tanks, and we fill those acrylic tanks with more scintillator. So again, scintillator is something that flashes when radioactivity goes through it. 
In this case, we actually use something called gadolinium loaded liquid scintillator. And here I'm really just trying to say gee whiz things to make people sound that this is cool. Um, so don't worry if you know gadolinium just sounds like a weird thing. This is an element, it grabs neutrons. So neutrons turn out to be one of the worst backgrounds for us. We're very scared of neutrons because they will make a signal that looks like wimps. And so we've surrounded our detector with something that really likes to eat neutrons and then give us a big signal when it's done so. So you can think of gadolinium as like a little Pac-Man moving through these giant tanks, eating neutrons, and then giving you a giant signal when it's done so or raising a big flag. So we have all of these giant acrylic tanks. This is postdoc Sally Shaw. She works at UCSB next to one of these big acrylic tanks. So we surrounded the detector with these tanks, filled those with scintillator, and then we surround that even with water to provide more shielding. So here's a picture of the one part of the vessel, the, the sort of central vessel in the water tank. So this again is all underground. These big white objects around the edge are the side tanks before we had put them in place. So you lower the big detector into this central vessel. And then once that's done, we move the acrylic tanks into place. And so this is what it looks like at the end where now you have in here behind this white reflector material is the central xenon. And then you have these giant acrylic tanks outside. And then those tanks are filled with this gadolinium loaded liquid scintillator. And then around everything, we have water in this tank. Now to see the light from the scintillator, we need more eyes. So we have a whole other set of eyes. This is graduate student Luke Corley installing a whole other set of eyes. Again, you can see more of these uh, photomultiplier tubes. Um, and this is the crew. You can see maybe some evidence of COVID times and the way that we are um, masking up, um, but we could not completely physically, socially distance during this time because people had to work together um, to construct this detector. Um, and in the end, the thing is now all built and ready to go. Okay, so what now? Um, LZ is commissioning. Um, what does that mean? Uh, it's a sort of euphemism for saying we're turning on and understanding what the heck we have. So we've spent you know seven years designing, a few years building. Um, it's all come together now and we're turning it on. And like any time you turn something on for the first time, there's always going to be some features. There's always going to be some bugs. And so we are learning what it means to run LZ. Um, and so right now we are doing that. And this is probably, you know, it's one of the most exciting times to be working in a detector because you really get to sort of learn what it is that you've built over the last several years. Now I should mention there's fierce competition internationally. Uh, dark matter, as I say, is a hot topic. Um, so there are actually two experiments that are very similar to LZ. There's a Panda X in China who actually just released a result in the last week. And then Xenon N Ton um, is another experiment in Italy also currently a commissioning. <clears throat> so all three of these experiments are in a race to try to get the next chunk of sensitivity and who knows what we will see. Um, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge my colleagues in LZ. So this is a picture from our uh, last collaboration meeting, which again, because of COVID was all remote. So you can see all the people on their Zoom calls. If you look closely, you'll see some dogs in here. Um, there's a few dogs, so we all have our pets. Um, but uh, everybody in, this, in these pictures in LZ, it's about 200 people has worked extremely hard to bring this experiment together. Um, and they, they're all uh, wonderful people. So we're pretty excited. This is the most exciting time in the experiment um, where we're first sort of seeing what the detector can do. So to learn more, there are many LZers at the virtual tables in Gathertown for Neutrino Day. And I hope you will go and check out what they have to say. Um, there's a few activities. You can learn more about what we mean when we talk about backgrounds. There's a nice exercise of trying to pick out you know, a particular signal in a background and how that gets easier as you reduce the background. And you can find more details about LZ itself also in the Neutrino Day activities. Um, so with that, I'll stop the main part of the talk. Thank you so much for listening. Um, you know, the stars are telling us that something is missing. Turns out we had to go underground to really build the telescope to, to, to understand more about what's going on. Um, and I want to thank uh, many people, including Matt Kaplost from SURF, for some of the pictures that I used in the talk. So thank you very much. Okay. Hugh, can you, uh, can you hear me? I can, yes. All right, wonderful. So we did get a few questions. Um, we got a question that said, we looked at your structure simulation. Do we see more structures being formed currently? Uh, that's a good question that I'm not 100% sure I know the answer to. Um, they are not being created in the same, at the same rates, that's for sure. Things, are, things have changed as, as the universe has expanded. Um, so I would say 
maybe I'll stop there and just not say something stupid okay. that I'm not 100% sure of the answer <laughs> of. But it's a good question. Okay, now this is a question from YouTube. So we do know people are watching from all different platforms, which is great. Uh, this person says, what's to say that the source of dark matter is even able to interact via the weak force? Could a particle only act interact through gravitation specifically? Yeah, this is another great question and something that you know keeps me up at night sometimes if I'm being honest, right? There's, there's no guarantee that a dark matter particle will actually be detectable in an experiment like LZ. Um, or if you're looking at other models of dark matter, so common ones would be something like an axion particle, um, there's no guarantee that they will be visible. Um, so what do you do about that sort of possibility? And in fact, we can even go back a step further and say there's no guarantee it's a particle at all, right? There are, there are a class of models where maybe we just don't understand gravity, um, and that's what's producing this extra gravitational force. Um, and so it's, it is a real possibility. Um, and I guess I would say that um, the, what sort of keeps me motivated <clears throat> is something along the lines of the WIMP coincidence, although maybe slightly more nuanced than that. So the weak force itself, the, the explicit weak force, um, we've more or less ruled out the most vanilla version of that, right? Our, our detectors are sensitive enough to have said, if it was actually the weak force as we understand it in neutrino interactions, we would have seen something, and we haven't. Now, that's not to say that there aren't other, other models that we're now still exploring. There are actually very good models that we're exploring, but that particular case is already actually ruled out. Um, so what, where does that leave you? Well, it leaves you with this big mystery. <clears throat> you know, we know that, that we know that our observations are telling us that something is missing, and we know that... Um, a particle explanation does fit with all of the relevant data. So that gives you, you know, a good reason to look for the, for, the, for the dark matter. And if you found it, it would be so sort of groundbreaking and changing. So it's high risk, high reward. Um, you know, what would the odds are that we find something? I wouldn't want to wager, um, but it's not zero and it's not, you know, 100%, unfortunately. So somewhere in there, depending on your prior is, you know, how much you devote your life to this. And it, it's something I do worry about, but I still find it worthwhile and interesting, as is the best I can say. Sure. And isn't that also part of the uh, the process as you learn what doesn't work? It's sort of like Edison saying that he found he didn't fail 2,000 times. He found 2,000 ways not to make a light bulb. That's right. Yeah. So, so certainly, um, as we have built these experiments, we have learned more about how to do it. And and learn more about what the dark matter is not, as I mentioned, and and that is a value for the theoretical understanding of what we're looking for. But again, it's not quite the same thing as discovering it. I have to say. Sure. Um, so. Sure. Um, so, how long has the assembly of the detector taken? That's a good question. I would say it started in earnest in 2017, maybe. Um, and really picked up in early 2018. So you, you saw the detector go underground was uh, end of the year 2018. But since then, we've had a whole bunch of other stuff to do underground to get all those, the systems back in place. But I would say assembly started really in 2017. Okay. And, but of course, planning for this started even while before the Lux experiment was running, correct? Correct. Yeah, that's right. So the, I think the first um, LZ sort of technical meeting was all, all the way 10 years ago now, 20, 2011. Sure. Wow. Um, and then sort of funding came around in around 2014. Okay. So I have one more question from our viewers. Um, how long will you be taking data? That's good. We have, uh, our plan is to take data for five years, roughly speaking. We want to get um, something like three calendar years of data um, and because, you know, you take calibration data because you have to make upgrades and there's some downtime, we, we expect that to sort of fill on order of five full actual years um, mm -hmm. of time. So we want to take that much data. We have some ideas for maybe extending it if, if we have, you know, interesting results or we have some upgrades, but the nominal plan is for five years. So we're starting this year. Um, we think first physics data is this year. And so for the next five years, we'll be collecting that data. And it's very exciting. Now I'm going to ask you two other things. I want to sure. know how big is your collaboration? You, you you showed us a picture of an awful lot of people on Zoom. Yeah, depending on how you count, I think we have around 200 people, um, and it's fluctuated a bit. You know, we had um, so engineers who helped in the, the construction and the design. Um, I think we include them because we, without them we would be completely lost. 
Um, but that gets you up over around 200 people. Okay. And we are in uh, something like 30 some institutions. Um, so universities okay. and labs in the US, um, in the UK, in Portugal and in South Korea. So we're international over four countries. Okay. Um, and it's a mix of, like I said, so there's, you know, students, so some undergraduate students, graduate students, um, faculty, engineers, and scientists at laboratories. Okay. Now, if you discover dark matter and you're the first experiment to discover it, what happens? Well, that's a good question there, too. Somebody <laughs> goes to Sweden and gets a Nobel Prize. I don't know who, right? <laughs> okay. Probably, it's a, it's a shame, actually, because Vera Rubin would have been, you know, a candidate, but she passed away recently. Um, and in a collaboration like ours, you know, nobody deserves all the credit, right? I, I'm currently the, the spokesperson, but that's a term for a, a year or two. There have been other, several others. Sure. So I'm just representing the 200 people who have worked so hard. Um, so I, you know, it's a huge deal. We'll have a massive party. Um, and somebody will get, you know, a big award. And I'm, but that's not why we're doing it, of course. Right. But uh, we'll right. see. But it, we, it is, we do these we do these experiments. Why? That's one of the questions I always get. You know, why do we do this type of experiment? I think everybody has a slightly different answer to that. I I can give you a generic answer, which is because it's a big mystery, right? Um, why are, you know, how are we here or why are we here? This type of experiment is answering that question. Um, and so I'm, I'm reminded of something that the director of, the first director of Fermilab, which of course has a huge relationship with SURF, um, the first director was a man named uh, Robert Wilson. And I think he was testifying before Congress in the 60s about the lab and was asked, you know, what is, you know, what does your laboratory do for the country or something like that? And the response, and I'm going to, I'm going to mangle it a little bit was, you know, our, the, the, the worth of these experiments is in making, you know, we provide value because I'm going to mess it up. I, I should have studied this before. Anyway, you should look up what Wilson said at Fermilab, but the, the, the gist of it is that we make the country worth defending, right? So we're not going to help the defense of the country, but because the country can do this type of exploration, do this type of basic science, understanding how humanity got here, that makes the culture worth defending. And so that was his answer. For me, I think the answer is slightly different. It's, you know, I find it super interesting, the dark matter, um, just, just the idea that, you know, there's this stuff that's passing through us all the time. It's very mysterious. If we could really find out what that is, how cool would that be? Um, and in the meantime, it's really fun like building these experiments you know i show all the pictures like they're just gorgeous gorgeous objects they they they're one of a one of a kind you know you work with these people who are experts at finding dust with uv lights like you just learn all this crazy stuff and so as like a professional professionally it's really exciting and, and fun to work on which you know so you have like the 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 abstract we're looking for dark matter but then in the in the day to day you get to work with these great people um, on something that's never been done before and one of the benefits, some, some things that might follow up are some of the ways that this technology then transfers to uh, bettering human lives. And, and we always talk about the, the space program and we talk about uh, Ernest Lawrence, who, who actually was from South Dakota, grew up in Canton, South Dakota, and uh, won a Nobel Prize in 1939 for his work on the cyclotron, which is has been used to in in med not the cyclotron itself but some technology produced from that that has been used in medical science is that right yeah that's right um there, so so basic physics research has led to a lot of applications which are used you know throughout you know throughout our daily lives so you know anytime you get a scan in a hospital for a medical application that's of, often a particle accelerator that's doing that scanning okay um an example is like sort of a strange example but the world wide web right the internet was actually invented at cern uh, you know a big high energy physics um, experiment to help better share our data and things like that so there are uh, throughout the you know history there are examples of where investment in basic research just for the sake of understanding has led to many, many, many applications that have changed our lives uh, in tremendous ways. The reason why I'm always a little hesitant to go straight to that is because you can't say what those will be, right? Right. I can't, I don't know from doing the dark matter research, what will be the spinoff. The odds are that there may be one, right? I mean, we've seen that in the past, but if I can't, you know, so you can say in some general terms, this will be valuable, but I can't say specifically why. And so I'm always a little, you know, hazy on that. Right. One. But it's, it certainly is, is true. 
But the, the big thing, I think, for researchers and other people who just really want to learn, it's just about learning. It's just about discovery and furthering our knowledge and our understanding and awareness of the universe, right? That's exactly right. All right. Well, I, I don't, we don't have any other questions, so I want to thank you for uh, joining us. This was a really fantastic talk. And so thank you so much, uh, folks. This is Dr. Hugh Lippincott with the University of of California at Santa Barbara. And uh, we, we hope to see you soon at SURF. So thank you. I'll be back, I'll be back soon, don't worry. All right. Now I'm just going to remind our uh, folks online and in other places that we have a couple of really exciting events coming up today. Um, if you've ever wondered what if, then you need to join us at one o'clock where two of our education specialists will, uh, will tell us, t uh, do some weird science demonstrations and we can learn about that. And at 4 p.m., Dr. Annette Lee, who is an astrophysicist and artist and director of the Native Skywatchers Initiative, is going to join us to talk about um, Lakota, Dakota, indigenous astronomy and the practice of combining, in, uh, pers combining perspectives to better understand all the phenomena around us. So, join us for those but in the meantime participate in all of our activities and uh, go to go visit uh, groups in our information area on Gathertown uh, so you can learn more about dark matter and you can learn more about neutrinos and you can uh, even learn about ventilation right here at SURF so uh, go stop by and then step back into the main stage the Black Hills Energy main stage to join us for these talks later today Thank you so much, and we'll be back in just a little. If you're just joining us, we will be starting our next event in just a moment. So stick with us. We're just getting some things set up on our other streaming platforms. So uh, we'll be back here in just a minute or so. And